Welcome to the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. It's brought to you by the folks here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, and we pray you receive a special blessing while spending the time here with us. And to God be the glory. You've got too many on there. My way was filled with danger, I felt alone, the enemy had singled me out to do me wrong, and when he drew near, my heart filled with fear. Then I heard someone dear calling me to his side And I ran under his wings And there he covered me And now I can sing And the enemy still looked for me, but what he can't see is that I'm under my Lord's wings, under his wings. Thunder rolled, dark clouds hung low, I was out in a storm, shivering the cold there, no safe retreat from harm. Then there blew strong wind, would this be my end? Then I heard my friend calling me to his side, and I read under The storm still rages, but in the rock of ages, I'm resting warmly here under my Lord's wings. Under His wings. And there He covered me, and now I'm Wonderful, wonderful. That was worth the wait. Thank the Lord for that. What a blessing. You have your Bibles this morning. Would you turn please to Luke chapter number eight? Luke chapter number eight. I want to encourage you that, uh, you know, I know a number of folks are not in the habit of Sunday school. And uh, which, you know, some folks, that's just the way they are. They don't care about Sunday school, and they had got into that into that situation. Uh, but I want to encourage you that God has blessed Brother Dwight in our Sunday school hour to bring to, to bring us some of the most tremendous 
uh, Bible messages that you'll ever hear anywhere. And I want to encourage you in that. God speaks to my heart. And uh, God speaks to a number of other hearts. And I'm, I'm very much interested in exposing myself to the word of God. Uh, you're not to be about many teachers, but you are to be about some. And uh, God's raised up for us a wonderful teacher and a man of God. And I want to encourage you to, uh, to be here to hear that. And uh, much preparation is in the, in the study of the Sunday school and uh, much care and prayer and uh, earnestness is given in the delivery. And I want to encourage you that you uh, expose yourself to that wonderful truth. And uh, this I'm not talking about just the young'uns now. Uh, it'll work its way on down. I'm talking about mamas and daddies. And uh, I'm so thankful and appreciative that God has taken and uh, done this for us. Not every church has... Uh, so a teacher in their Sunday school. I mean, not everybody that stands up is a teacher. And God gifts the church with teachers, pastors, evangelists. And uh, I want to encourage you that you, you're missing out if you miss out on our Sunday school time together. I have a little bit of a different message this morning than what I normally would speak about. But it's on my heart, and I'd like to take and deliver it. And, of course, uh, when it gets on my heart, I'll, it'll sit there a little while, and then I'll take and deliver it and get it off my heart, I hope. You know, I hope it just kind of something else gets on there. Uh, if not, I have to preach it again. But I'm going to go ahead and just preach it one time here and uh, trust that it'll take, it, take hold. I, I'd like to speak to you this morning. When I consider one of the saddest verses in the Bible, one of the saddest verses in the Bible, look with me, if you will, in verse 26 of Luke chapter 8. And they arrived at the country of the Gadareans, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time and wear no clothes. That ought to be a hint right there. Neither abode in, their ha in any house, uh, but in the tombs. He's a wild man. Lived out yonder in the graveyard, run around naked. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? This is an instance in which the devil has taken and invaded a life. And the devil certainly knows who Jesus is. And he calls Jesus by name and he's using this man's body his life, his body, communicating with the Lord. We've got a lot of demon possession now in America. I know we don't think of much about it because we already pushed it over yonder into the Congo somewhere. But I'll tell you, there's more demonism in America right now than what you'll ever realize. And it's an, it's an awful sight. And the devil cried out, what, Jesus, now what have I got to do with you, son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oft times it had cut him or caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Now let me just stop long enough to say this. When folks are full of the devil, you can't control them. You can't control them. I, I mean, you can bind them up if you want to. And uh, you can sedate them if you want to. You can do whatever you want to. But the devil, if he's in somebody, they're going to act crazy. Does that make sense? We got a lot of crazy acting people 
in our hour, which are just full of the devil. Now, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm just commenting as I'm reading through here, but you can see that, can't you? And Jesus asked him, saying, what is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine. Now, in the Alabama language, that is hog. You know, it's hogs. That's what that was. There's a, there's a herd of hogs there. And they, that is the devils, besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. That is, the devil said, if we can't have our place in this man's life, uh, let us go out, yonder and live in the hogs. Now, that's exactly what's going on right now. The devil's made people live like hogs. The devil's second choice, if he can't have first choice in your life, is to make something make you live like a hog. Because his second choice is a hog. That helps us out, don't it? Oh, y'all ain't with me. Y'all ain't with me. But y'all, y'all, y'all get there after a while. And he suffered them. The Lord let them go. Then went the devils out of the man, entered into the swine. By the way, Hogs ain't the only animals full of the devil. I've seen a few dogs full of the devil. Y'all ever seen one? Yeah, I have. And I might, I might have been on a horse or two that was full of the devil. I don't know. But, the, but he, they entered into the, into the swine and the herd run violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Now, you can tell when the devil is in something because uh, a hog don't run violently down a hill. They'll run down a hill, but they'll generally go crossways down it, not straight down a steep place. They're too big. They can't keep their, they can't keep their footing. And then when they did hit the water, they drowned themselves. Sometimes I think animals got more sense than people do. Somebody say man right there. They just didn't want to give their life to a hog, to give their life to the devil. The hogs didn't, you know. Boy, if I ever get down to my verse, I'm going to. They ran down to the lake and were choked, and they that fed them saw what was done. They fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his right mind. Praise God. And they were afraid. Looked like they'd have been afraid of him when he was out of his mind. Don't you think? But now he's clothed and in his right mind, fitting at, sitting at the feet of Jesus, and they're afraid. They also, which saw it, told them by what means he was made, he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadareans round about sought him to depart from them. For they were taken with great fear. And he went up unto the ship and returned back again. Verse 37 is one of the saddest verses in the Bible to me. It said the whole multitude of the country of the Gadareans round about besought him, that is Christ, to depart from them. There are some sad verses and sad scenes in the Bible. As you read the Bible, you can't help but to be uh, somewhat touched by some of the sadnesses that you read about. I think it's a pretty sad scene over in Genesis chapter 4 where Cain is 
uh, cast out from the presence of the Lord. As he was marked and as he's wandering here and there, he says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Of course, he's murdered his brother. And certainly there ought to be a mark put upon a murderer. Somebody say amen right there. They ought not get off scots free and just go without punishment. I mean, we're, li- we're living in a time when, uh, you know, that's a pretty desperate situation. That's a sad sight, though. Here's a man whose punishment is so bad he can't bear it. How about David? That's a very touching scene when his son Absalom is slain. And uh, David is looking for him to come home. And he stands on the balcony and he recognizes his boy is not coming home any longer. And he says, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Oh, Absalom, my son. You can almost hear the hurt in his heart, the regret for his having uh, treated the boy as he has. I think it's a pretty sad uh, situation. I think a pretty sad uh, verse in the Bible where the Solomon, wisest man in the Bible, constantly reaffirms through that book of Ecclesiastes, I've experienced everything that life has to offer and he sums it up by saying it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. This world has nothing for us and this world has nothing for a lost man. When you finally draw the line and add in all of the dealer prep and the tax and the Virginia tax and property tax, brother, uh, the idea that Solomon says it's all just vanity, a puff of air, vexation of spirit. It's pretty sad to have that kind of philosophy about life. It's really a philosophy about self, and uh, that's a sadness. The rich young ruler came to Jesus said to him, said, I'll follow you just anywhere. The Lord Jesus laid out the terms, you know, and the Bible said of that rich young ruler that he went away sorrowful because he had many possessions. That's a great sadness to me, a great sadness. Herod had John the Baptist killed for Herodias' sake. That's a mean thing to do, wouldn't you say? Put the Baptist preacher's head on the chopping block? I'd say that was a sadness. It certainly is a sadness. I think of the betrayal of Judas towards Jesus. You couldn't have imagined something sadder than such a betrayal. Then the mob howling out and crying, crucify him, crucify him. You know. My, what a sadness. The Bible is many sad Stories to tell. But this verse to me that I read to you, where the Gadareans came out and the whole multitude requested that Jesus would leave them is a sad, sad verse to me. It looks like having heard, having seeing, having experienced what Jesus could do and what Jesus has done and what Jesus would do for them, they would have invoked him to stay. It looks like they would have not only requested that he stayed, but insisted that he stayed with them. Looks like that's what would have happened to me, you know. It looks like even out of common courtesy, maybe even out of curiosity, maybe maybe it would have been just because they had wanted to see something else that that crowd would have given the Lord at least a favorable response. They would have at least come to a reasonable verdict, wouldn't you have thought? 
We need to investigate this a little bit more. Over in Acts chapter number four, in Acts three, there was a fellow there at the temple. You remember him and he couldn't walk and he's begging and brother, they, Peter and James, they, they said, we don't have any silver, we ain't got no gold, but such as we have in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And that boy went flying through the temple, shouting her out and boy, it was a sight. Man, the Pharisees caught a halt to it. They said, we can't have this go on. We need to silence Peter. We need to silence James. And uh, some of the others said, well, listen, fellas, you're going to have a hard time silencing them because you can see, behold the man, a notable miracle has been done. I expect this is a notable miracle in the land of the Gadareans right here. Surely somebody should have taken and said, wait just a minute. Let's investigate this. Let's look at it a little closer. Looks like the evidence itself would have demanded that the people look at it. I want to say to you, precious friend, the Bible said over here, Jesus said in chapter number seven there, verse number 35, but wisdom is justified of all her children. The book of First Corinthians said over there that the gospel concerning the gospel of our Lord Jesus and the, and the cross, he says, for after the wisdom of the God, the world, by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The Jews require sign, Greeks seek after wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But to them that are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of and the wisdom of God. It seems to me like they would have certainly wanted to know who the Lord was. But wisdom, worldly wisdom, rejected Christ completely. Now, why is this verse so sad to me? I want to give you just a thought or two and, and you take it home with you and, and just investigate it yourself and see if it's not sad. One reason it's sad to me is because it's so true to life. It is just so true to life. It is so often repeated. Those that have seen the most, those that have heard the best, those that have experienced the greatest, how often they reject and allow what they've heard, seen, and experienced to become commonplace. It seems to me as if these had just give us public testimony that human nature has not changed. These Gadareans, they really don't want anything to do with God or with Jesus. Has it changed a whole lot? I've noticed that, you know, in the Bible there's several Tremendous pictures of this. In fact, it's all the way through there. You take, take a day in which men and women have taken and left God and uh, they, there's one fella in that town that knows the Lord. His name is Lot. But you really couldn't tell he knew a whole lot about the Lord. And uh, Lot's living there in Sodom and Gomorrah. He chose that life, you remember. Abraham said, choose you out which way you want to go. He said, if you go this way, I'll go that way. Lot saw that world down there where he could raise his cattle in some marketplace to sell his cattle. And Lot chose that. And when Lot chose that, dear friend, moved his family down there, lost his family down there in the world. But in the midst of that, 
Lot's home is the only home in Sodom that knows the true and living God. Lot's wife is the only woman that is exposed to a man that knows something about Christ, about God. And having all this knowledge of God and having all this relationship that she had with those that had gone on before, having seen, heard, experienced the best, she rejects it. Looks back, becomes a pillar of salt. Isn't that a sadness? I was was thinking about the sons of Eli. Eli knew about the Lord. Eli had the testimony of God upon him. Eli was the high priest of God. Service of God had been all of his life. But he had two sons who though they knew the temple service, the sacrifice, the meaning, and all of that, these boys reject the testimony of their father and they offer up strange fire to God and they're nothing more than just heathens in the preacher's office. God has to kill them. That's awful sad. Awful sad. I was thinking about the, the, the Pharisees of the New Testament. If anybody knew the truth, it should have been them. They rejected the truth. How true to life that is. How so often repeated this is. I was thinking about this, how greatly illustrated this truth is in the Bible. You take Capernaum. Jesus' main place of operation, Capernaum. He did miracle and miracle, talk, talk, parable, parable. And Capernaum shut their eyes as to who Jesus was. He said, if what had been done for you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they had repented long ago in sackcloth and in ashes. But they didn't. How about Jerusalem? Jerusalem. Jesus said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would have gathered you under my wing as a hen doeth gather her chicks, but ye would not. What a sadness come upon these places. So often repeated, so openly illustrated in the Bible, so obviously real to human nature. They didn't want Jesus to rule and reign over them. Then again, not only because it's true to life do I think this is a sad verse, but I think this is a sad verse because it so rejects the truth of God. It so rejects God's truth and uh, God's light. I was reading over in the Gospel of John early this morning, and Brother Dwight just about just about got, got me on it. The Bible said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's where we generally stop. But he goes on to say this For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. I don't know that it could get any clearer than that, do you? I don't know that it could get any more black or white than that. If you believe, you're not condemned. If you don't believe, you are condemned. Because, he says, are condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Now, what is the condemnation? Here it is. That light is come into the world. Jesus went into the land of the Gadareans and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. 
For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. Hallelujah. I want to say to you, dear friends, here's a rejection of truth and light. This is not an ignorant rejection. It's a foolish rejection. It's a willful rejection, but it's not an ignorant rejection because, dear friend, they intelligently know who Jesus is. They had the facts. They were able to reason. They were able to speculate, if you please. They made what was in their minds a logical, reasonable choice not to come to Christ. That's pretty sad, isn't it? The world... As far as I can see, the world boasts about what it knows. It boasts about having knowledge. We live in an information age, you know. I'm amazed at all the things that they could put in that little phone. Ain't y'all? I mean, if I knew how to do it, I, I can. Now, there'll be a question come up. Sister Ann, she can slide over there and, and in just a minute she'll fact, fact check me. You know. She can find it. If I was on a computer, man, there's no telling what you could learn on a computer. We're living in an information age. You know. And the world by wisdom. Information, knowledge, does not know God. They're without the knowledge of God. It's hellish, it's devilish, it's wicked. And that's the world we're living in. In fact, their rejection of Christ is based on the worldly advantages that they thought they were enjoying. Their riches, their goods, Hogs. They'd rather have hogs than the Son of God. They'd rather have their goods than they had the spiritual benefits of knowing the Christ, of having his word. That's exactly where we are in our country. That's exactly where we are in our cities. That's where we are in our churches. We would rather have what we think and deem a treasure than to have the Son of God in our presence. Oh, precious friend of mine, our society today has rejected Christ and it's chosen the pigs. Isn't that right? And consequently, you tell somebody long enough that they came from a monkey and they act like a pig, that's what they'll do. That's what's happened in our world. That's what happened to our school system. Give God his walking orders. We don't need you. We don't need what you offer. We don't need your Bible. We don't need your influence. And the next thing you know, we ain't got it. It's a sadness. I love football. Y'all like football. Wasn't that a good game last yesterday? Praise God. Kind of sad last week, but yesterday was pretty good. But isn't it true that we've got a we've raised up a whole generation that fall at the altar where the pigskin lies? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Sure, sure. I'm trying to y'all are missing my point. Y- y- are you seeing my point? What a sadness it is because truth and light have been rejected. Been rejected. Let me give you a third thought right here. Not only true to life is the story right here. Not only have they rejected truth and light, but because this verse is so sad because it's so tragic, so lethal. I mean, the results of this verse is this. 
they lose the presence of Christ. You talk about tragic. Now, somebody says, oh, Brother Ralph, my sin only hurts me. My rejection of Christ only hurts me. Well, you're crazy. I mean, you're crazy as a, as a, 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 well, I don't know how crazy you are. I mean, a little boy got, got in the bathtub and was playing with a ping pong ball and bing, 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 bing everywhere. That's how crazy you are. Your sin doesn't only affect you, dear friend. It affects this present generation right now. Achan sinned. And he not only was punished, but his whole family was punished. It affects you right now, right now. And not only does it affect you, but it affects everyone around you. I mean, your children, the next generation, they won't know God if you don't show them God. No. And the generation to follow, they won't have any idea about God. A people cannot be happy at all just existing. Life without God is just existing. No wonder we have folks that are so disgruntled, so negative, so down on life. No wonder all the philosophies that we got out of out from the from our universities and, and from our pulpits. No wonder the these philosophies are so damning in our hour. Because we give God his walking papers. Notice what it said in verse 37. It said they went out, they besought him to depart from them. And look at what it said. For they were taken with great fear and he went up into the ship and returned back again. The Lord Jesus went right back to where he was. He left them. And all of his influence left with him. No, thank you, Lord, we don't need you, is what they said. No, thank you, Lord, we don't want you. No, thank you, Lord, we won't have you. What a terrible thing that is. Can you imagine? And yet this has happened over and over and over again in our country. Hasn't it happened in city after city? In county after county. Hadn't it happened, and you can see it worldwide, country after country. Our civilization has left God. Multiplied millions are saying, if they're not saying it with their lips, they're saying it with their heart. No, thank you. We don't want you. It's a sadness. We'd rather have the things our way or rather things the way they were before you come on the scene. We want our lunatics. We love to have our lunatics. We like going out to the graveyard and watching them run around and act crazy. We want our devils. That's what they're saying. We want the fear. You men, now it used to be where just women were afraid to walk at night up some of these streets and things. I tell you now, it's where all of us are afraid to ride up and down some of these streets, some of these places. We want our superstitions. We want our hogs. Ain't nobody in here loves pork chop better than me. That's it. It's the only way I want it. Unless it's a little neck bones and rice. (laughs) But you hear what I'm saying. We've given this idea of life without God, we've given it so much credence in our world. Our young ones don't know anything about the Lord. We don't want the difference that Christ makes in our individual lives. 
the difference he makes in an economy. We're not interested in that. There's too much thievery, too much greed, too much. We don't want that. We, 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 we don't want what the difference Christ will make in our, in our manners, in our morals, in our, in our, our means of living. We don't want that. Because it'll mean too much. Lord, if you stay here, you'll change everything that we've worked for. We're sorry we, we don't need you. Would you please leave? Well, guess what? He left. You talk about a tragedy. Life without God, a city without God, the light and the influence of God gone. Darkness and depravity and depression and degradation taken over. The Bible said the wicked shall be turned into hell in all nations that forget God. And I guess you could say we're going to hell in a handbasket successfully on the national level. Just think what could have been if they'd have said, Please stay. If they had said, please stay. Verse number 40 says, and it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, that is, he went back to where he left. He said, when he, when he returned, the people gladly received him. They were all waiting for him. What, what if he had got that kind of a welcome? You talk about revival breaking out. You talk about God moving and, and folks being healed or folks being saved. Man, that'd have been something, wouldn't it? You talk about people being rescued, redemption being a reality. You talk about, about repentance going on. What a testimony to youngins it would have been had Jesus just stayed. Righteousness moves in. The devil and sin and wickedness, and doubt, and defeat, move out. I suppose this is probably one of the saddest verses in the Bible to me. Unless, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 is sad. Listen to what it says. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And here it is. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. These are folks that go to hell right out of the midst of the church. I'm talking about sadness this morning. Sadness. Sadness. Listen, friend. Don't let the Lord depart. Don't leave without Christ having moved into that heart. Come. Come quickly. And come now. Bible said today is the day of salvation. The Gadareans closed their mind against God, gave Christ his walking papers, and he walked. And he didn't come back. It's a dreadful thing to close your mind and your heart upon the Lord. Saddest verse in the Bible, one of the saddest verses in the Bible to me, the other one is that when God cast those that have been in the house of God into hell because they never received him. What a sadness. What's the condition of your life and heart now? I'm not here to throw rocks at you. I'm here as a sinner who's been saved Trying to tell other sinners 
where they can get saved. I'm here as a man who's been hungry and has found the bread of life trying to tell others who might be hungry where they can get the bread of life. I did not, when I got saved, did God call me to preach? I didn't get called to preach to hurt people. I got a little confused about that at the start. But God called me to preach so that I could help people. Help them to come to Him. And if you're here and you're lost, you don't have to be lost. You can be saved. If you'll trust him, he'll save you. He'll save you. Would you stand with me? Because our heads are... Thank you for spending the time with us at the Blue Ridge Baptist Church YouTube channel. And while you're here, please select from our playlist previous messages from both our pastor, Brother Ralph Coleman, and many other preachers and evangelists. So avail yourself of these ministers of the gospel and share with friends and family, and I know you will both find and be a blessing. And as always, from here at Blue Ridge Baptist Church, to God be the glory. It is